modeling, mathematical modeling of uh, process. And of course, if you're a modeler of process, the most challenging process there is to model is human history because it is the sum total of a vast number of consciously manipulated variables. So uh, modelers look at human history. They have for a long, long time. Herodotus had a theory of history. Hesiod had a theory of history. Marx, Vico, so forth. I think what moves me to talk about this this evening is the fact that uh, the world just seems quite crazy at the moment. We seem to have gone over some kind of cusp or some kind of tightening of the gyre in terms of uh, the human collectivity just beginning to come apart. On the New York Times this morning, there's a picture of Khomeini's funeral in Tehran, a picture of three million people involved in mass mourning. And if you can't get 100,000 people into the streets, for your point of view, uh, you must not be trying these days. Crowds of less than a million hardly count uh, in the last few weeks. So... um, You know, philosophy is supposed to ask the question, what is going on? And then possibly shed some light on that or create probes which uh, somehow act to illuminate some part of the historical process. So I wanted to talk about this this evening and make uh, a couple of points initially and then sort of overview the situation and see if there's reason for hope or reason for concern. And to, just to try and decondition ourselves for a moment from some of our ordinary assumptions about uh, history and uh, planetary crisis. And... Uh, try and think about it from a slightly larger point of view. The first point to consider is um, the brevity of history. There's a kind of uh, recidivist faction in occult thought that is tremendously impressed by how old everything is. And they want to push back the dates on everything and say that, you know, the pyramids are 50,000 years old, like Titicaca, 135,000. This is occult archaeology. Uh, the truth that is revealed by, uh, scient- you know, consistent scientific analysis of sites around the world poses the question of, How did it all happen so quickly? The brevity of human history, that it's happened in uh, basically 1,500 generations. It's happened in the last 35,000 years, most of it in the last 10,000 years. It's some kind of breakaway process in our species which we, because we only live 80 years, tend to take for granted, or at least tend to struggle to come to terms with. I mean, what else can you do? But the overwhelming uh, uh, fact of it is that it is, uh, on the scale of the life of the planet, a process as ephemeral as a lightning strike. You know, it's just a flash, 35,000 years. I mean, life has been around 3.5 billion years. That's uh, a million times longer. So uh, here we are embedded in what must then be seen as an extremely improbable set of circumstances, human history. So what is it? 
It's, uh, it's some kind of uh, breakaway process in the language forming capacity of the species that somehow command of symbols and expansion of recall and coordination of imagery and all of these high-grade manipulations of data are taking place to create for the first time a new kind of order in the universe. It's epigenetic order. That means it is not coded into DNA. It is not carried along by biology. It is ephemeral, epiphenomenal to biology, dependent on it, but in some sense more enduring. It's alphabets, codes, language, graven stone, magnetic tape, books, speech, dance, ritual, all of these things are epigenetic information transfer. This began to tear loose. Well, the, we have a flute that's 25,000 years old. S some modern thinkers on the emergence of language put it at about 35,000 years ago. Yesterday. And that adaptation began a cascade of cultural effects that we have yet to come to grips with. I mean, we are propelled by it. It's as though, you know, the very slow rising, smooth surfaced wave of the hominid ontogeny that had moved forward for millions of years suddenly began to encounter turbulence and to break apart into this much more complex situation that required coding and reinforced coding and so set us up for this phenomenon which has taken over the planet and which has knitted everything together now. And that's the next uh, major point that I want to talk about. That when you stand off from this planetary process and try to get a generalized uh, objective handle on what is going on, you have to speak in very general terms. And it, for me, it comes down to saying what appears to be going on is that there is what I call, borrowing the term from Whitehead, concrescence. That everything is being pushed toward a state of greater and greater density, compactedness, connectedness, uh, integration into itself. You see this as you look at the whole history of the universe. I mean, the, the universe, if we believe the myth of science, is born in an explosion of such power that there are not even atomic systems because uh, the basic constituents of matter cannot settle down around uh, and form uh, orbital systems. Only after the universe has cooled substantially do you get atomic chemistry. Still later, after more cooling, you get uh, molecular chemistry. And then, after a long period in which molecular chemistry works its permutations, you get uh, life. But each one of these stages of advancing complexity occurs more rapidly than the stages which preceded it. In other words, the universe viewed in total can be seen as a kind of condensing apparatus for something which I've so far called complexity or novelty. And life is the most recent manifestation of it on a three billion year scale. Culture is the most recent manifestation of it on a million year scale. And electronically integrated global culture is the 20th century manifestation of it. Well, it means that history is like self-reflection through the medium of language propelling itself into self-recognition. And this process happens very quickly. What does it lead to? 
this is the question. And I think uh, in looking at what's going on this week, it seems that we have turned a corner in terms of this density of complexification and that sooner or later or slowly and bit by bit, people are beginning to realize that there is some kind of global, uh, integrated global process of unfolding that is taking place, that human history is not owned by anybody, not the major banks, not the Japanese, not CBS. It is actually out of control or not in the control of any integrated group of human beings, but that it is not the, uh, the existential model of history that is taught in the universities, which is, I mean, wrap your mind around this, the, the model of history taught in the universities is that history is what they call trendlessly fluctuating. <laughs> <laughs> the only phenomenon they are willing to admit is trendlessly fluctuating. <laughs> but it isn't. Clearly what is happening, I think, is there is uh, a, a kind of global emergence of a new mental order. And um, it's here... There is a phenomenon that is very brief and short-lived, I think, called the New Age. But it is a part of this global unfolding. And what this global unfolding is about, uh, well, if we had to create a name for it, which you have to have a banner if you're going to march, is um, the Archaic Revival. So I wanted to present the notion of the Archaic Revival as a kind of metaphor into which you can pour the events of the daily paper and have it perhaps make a little bit more sense. The notion is this. It's that when cultures hit moments of great crisis, they go into a kind of spasm because the old decision-making processes, the old solutions don't deliver the goods. And by reflex, without reflection, the response of societies in crisis when this happens is to reach backward into time for an older model. When we see this in uh, so-called primitive societies, i.e. pre-literate societies, Anthropologists call it a revitalization movement. It means you look back into the past and you choose a set of circumstances in the past that seem to shed light on your predicament and then you culturally work to realize them. The last time this happened for us was at the breakup of uh, the medieval world when the church was seen through the wars of religion to no longer be a direct pipeline to God and people were sort of uh, at loose ends about all this, uh, they reached back to classical Greece and Rome and created classicism. I mean, classicism is a creation of the 15th century. It comes a thousand years, you know, 1500 years after the civilizations it apes. And yet they created then classic architecture, neo-Roman law, so forth and so on. And that worked up until uh, the 20th century. And sometime in the 20th century or late in the 19th century, depending on how keen a nose you have, there was the smell of burning flesh in the air and it was clear that the ideals of the Enlightenment were not going to serve. People like Alfred Jarry in 1885 and uh, L'Entremont who said that he thirsted for the kind of beauty that arises when a bicycle meets a sewing machine on an operating table. <laughs> and uh, 
you know, there were anticipations of, uh, of the 20th century. The, the surrealists are not given their due in all of this. Uh, the, you know, Freud gets a lot of credit, but he was cribbing from the surrealists like crazy, you may be sure. In fact, major portions of the cultural adventure of the 20th century, I'm suggesting to you, can be seen as, uh, as obeying these rules that I've just laid out for you about a revitalization movement. And that the archaic revival, so great is the paralysis of our society, so appalling the contradictions that have been unleashed by 500 years of the unrestrained practice of science, that in order to um, advance a metaphor which has even a hope of commanding the attention of the global mind, we have to reach back, far back, not to dynastic Egypt, not to, uh, you know, the Mussolini-like states of Ur and Chaldea, none of that, but actually back to the dawn, to a period before the entire set of institutions and psychological ratios that characterize our personalities and our civilizations had had a chance to arise. Now, McLuhan, who is much discredited and sneered at, but very few people actually read or understand him, was keen to make the point that uh, electronic culture would be tribal culture, that it would be symbol ruled culture, that it would be culture of the immediate image. Uh, The uh, integration of human machine interfacing, the progress in what is called virtual reality technology, which is technologies that create the illusions of artificial modes of existence, the, in short, migration together of the uh, two great Manichaean opposites in our society, cybernetics and pharmacology. This is hard upon us. We are uh, this concrescence, this compression of novelty that I spoke of seems to me to be a process which is beginning to slam doors on all kinds of cheerful futurist scenarios that have emerged from the rationalist side of management. Because, you see, their tendency to extrapolate trends into the future is completely bedeviled by the tendency of everything to be influenced by everything else everything to be self-reinforcing, things to proceed not asymptotically but logarithmically. And in short, the time scales seem too compressed for any sort of ordinary management solution to come into play. Well, what then is going on? Well, being an optimist, and also a a, uh, sort of a weekend dabbler in shamanism and that sort of thing. Uh, What you have to rely on in the face of a question like that is a vision. You know, what what is going on? Or how how can it work in this situation and have a happy ending? That's the thing, see. And uh, what I've come up with is the notion that um, we need to construct a model that operates on many different levels. It should be able to operate as an elbow in the ribs. It should be able to operate as a set of integrated mathematical formulae. It should be able to operate as an obscene joke. I don't have an obscene joke, but uh, 
uh, I'll stop and tell you a story which amused me. Do you know what you get when you cross the godfather with a professor of semiotics? No one knows. <clears throat> you get someone who makes you an offer that you can't understand. <clears throat> I hope I'm not that person. <laughs> anyway, um, what I've come up with uh, on the one-hour lecture to the community at Esalen level of the distillation of the quintessence of the essence of the alchemical, uh, whatchamacallit, is uh, basically goes something like this. There is... Um, there is, there was, there always has been something which has been called many things. But in order to avoid misunderstanding, I will use new words for it. And I'll call it the transcendental object in hyperspace. And, and what it is, is it is your heart's desire. It is your heart's desire but it is the transcendental object in hyperspace. And you don't even know what your heart's desire is. And it is fractal, which means it is multi-leveled, self-integrating, refracting, reflecting. It has many densities. It has many aspects. So it is not only you, but it is your dyad. It is your... Uh, class, race, country, w whatever. It can be cut any of these ways. The transcendental object in hyperspace. And it imparts telos. Telos is a fancy Greek word that means purpose. It imparts telos to being. It acts as an attractor to use a word which is now current in dynamics. It, it acts as an attractor, meaning everything swivels toward it in its vicinity. And it is a way of thinking of human history is to think of it as a kind of shock wave which precedes the eminence of this transcendental object. Now, in Christian theology, this transcendental object is called the eschaton. It means the end thing. The end thing. It, it is, you know, a mystery beyond knowing. It has to be. It's the umbilicus. It's where the whole linguistic um, thing is tied together. It's the shock wave of the presence of this thing in the history of the planet is what is causing human history. It's as though there were leakage from the future event backward in time, 1% leakage, something like that. It's basically, you know, the feeling before an electrical storm when the air is still and the sky turns yellow and everything is, and you know it's coming. Well, that's human history but it lasts 10,000 years. And within it, the monkeys go nuts because the nearness of the transcendental object is shedding symbols into the unconscious, which are causing religious systems, dreams, messianic uh, careers, dynastic uh, visionaries, empire builders, uh, all kinds of people who are in tune with this transcendental object are attempting to manipulate their own time and space, their own lives, their own armies and uh, what have you, to create the paradisical end state, which they can feel as eminent but which they just can't quite get a handle on the provinces or the intellectuals or somebody to make it happen. All religions, all governmental schemes, all of our personal dreams are reflections, micro-reflections, microtonal resonances and echoes 
of the sum total of the sum total of this transcendental object and we can't say what it is and i'm not by leaving that question open trying to suggest that it's god at least not god in the ordinary sense i understand it which is that force which hung the stars like lamps in heaven i don't i, I don't believe it m- must be that but i can entertain the notion that biology somehow life in order to be what it is operates in dimensions that are completely hidden to us in our particular slice of the energy flow and the time matrix and everything we do not understand what we are we do not understand what life is we do not understand what mind is we haven't the faintest notion what time is don't think that because some guy in a sweater can write some fishy equations on the blackboard that anybody has a grip on what is going on this cold uh, this cold fusion thing should have been a real lesson to us peasants because uh, the lords of the high castle uh, still haven't gotten their desks straightened up uh, and uh, you know there was an ugly scramble there i mean it turns out that if you claim with enough force then well nobody really does know what the laws of the universe are so uh, what are you going to do well this notion that we are caught up in the emergence of some kind of transcendental uh something or other into the space-time stream of the planet the the major evidence for it you see is ourselves that we we have after only a thousand years of science a reasonable handle on the notion that there may be planets with meadows and rivers and brooks and birds and locusts and seals but we are the aliens here we are the apparent artifacts of a higher order of intelligence we are the uh, active force on the planet that is carrying out its uh, program in dimensions completely ontologically different from everything else that is going on well what does this mean how are we to take ourselves what is it all about well i think uh, that why the archaic revival notion works is because all this was pretty well understood and in place and in the bone before anybody moved out of stonework and into chipped antlers uh this has to do with the organization of ourselves it is primary uh and precedes all the affectations of history so this is what we primarily are and this um what it boils down to is a relationship to the planet that has been somehow perturbed somehow perturbed probably because the language forming thing is was some kind of experiment on the part of nature and you know the judgment isn't in yet i mean it is this omni adaptive uh sort of ability that allows you to grapple with any situation but perhaps too well because you exceed the bounds of the context and then begin to wreak havoc over things the central figure in the archaic revival is the shaman and my interest in all of this led me to spend a lot of time in the amazon basin where there is a highly evolved hallucinogenic plant shamanism and the power and peculiarity of those experiences convinced me 
that this probably was the primary uh, source of the impulse to religio in the human being, that these ecstasies, these synesthetic states of boundary dissolution, these uh, visionary transformations of eidetic material seem to me the only phenomenon in nature that could uh, bear the weight of uh, the claims made by uh, the practitioners of the shamanic experience. That there is in fact in human beings some kind of appalling, vast dimension of transcendental otherness that is as baffling to a 20th century psychotherapist as it was to a Magdalenian shaman or a shaman of the Amazon basin today. I mean, we are um, the great mystery. And uh, this sort of brings me full circle because I mentioned that my other concern was rescuing indoles for psychotherapy. You know, we are caught in a a tremendous historical crisis and what we lack in this crisis is consciousness. Whatever that means, the ability to integrate data about the situation that we are in. You know, Whitehead said, understanding is the apperception of pattern as such. I mean, if you see a pattern in how people are seated in this room, you understand something. If you see another pattern, you understand yet more. Apperception of pattern is what understanding is. These uh, hallucinogenic indole plants that were integrated into the human diet uh, uh, as human populations developed on the grasslands of Africa actually acted as catalysts for the language-forming ability in human beings. Small mouth noises linked to a rapid-fire ability to control and exchange syntax becomes a kind of telepathy, you know? And people say, wow, what is this? And what can we do with it? And then you're just off and running a possible transformation of language that uh, the psychedelic research in the 1960s hinted at before it was all closed down is the idea of some kind of uh, visualized synesthesia. This isn't a new idea. Philo Judaeus, who was a second century Alexandrian Jew, wrote about what he called the more perfect logos, The Logos was an informing voice that uh, Hellenistic spiritualism took very seriously uh, and Plato had a demon and it was was an informing voice. But but Philo Judeus said, what would be the more perfect Logos? And then he answered his own question and said, a more perfect Logos would be... uh, a language that passed from being heard to being beheld without ever passing over a moment of transition. Well, this, this kind of thing is uh, uh, part of the human psychedelic legacy. This is the kind of stuff which shamans have been manipulating for each other's amusement and uh, mental health care for uh, a long, long time. And it's what technology will inevitably seek to mimic and create, you know. If the molecular pharmacologists, the true reductionists of pharmacology are to be believed, then it should be possible to make a a, a psychoactive compound that causes you to whistle the first eight bars of Dixie and that's it, you know? I mean, their claim is that the atom to the thought is linked that closely. Well, we'll see. But 
culture is moving off planet and into this era of very dense compression of effects so that everything that happens is linked to everything else. And we are literally almost becoming our data. I mean, we speak of environments that are completely machine created. We occupy these environments, some of us, many hours a day, interfacing with word processors and data searching com computers and this sort of thing. Consciousness in the drive to self-reflect may, uh, you know, the, the monkey body is now almost ancillary. I mean, we are like coral animals in a vast reef of excreted technological material that is wired for solid-state data transfer. <laughs> and within that, we scurry around doing our little tasks, but we come and go. The instrumentality uh, remains and replicates and grows. Uh, and since we don't know what this process is about, we hardly know what kind of a stance uh, to take. I believe, again, because I choose to be an optimist, that uh, we could not be experiencing these kinds of tidal forces on the structure of our historical matrix if it weren't so that we must be very close to some kind of cusp or some kind of uh, phase transition where it all becomes something else rather suddenly. And, you know, anticipating this is uh, the great joy of futurists. I, I think that uh, it may spell, it may really blow our minds. It may spell the breakup of the entire uh, male-dominated, uh, rational, linear, phonetic alphabet shell game that's been going on for a while. The major motif that characterizes the Dawn Age shamanic stance is um, partnership as opposed to dominator styles of culture and a greatly enhanced role for women. And in fact, the whole thing can be seen as a struggle over, in the broadest sense, the feminine. In other words, the boundary-dissolving archetype versus the square-it-off-and-hold-it archetype, which, uh, as human populations moved out of the African cradle 15 to 20,000 years ago, these being the first pastoral populations, uh, they fell away from this partnership model, probably for climatological reasons, perhaps because psychoactive plants that they had grown dependent on were no longer available in the new zones. Notice that the whole story of Eden is the story of the struggle over a woman's relationship to a psychoactive plant. Because, uh, you know... And it specifically says they will become, Yahweh says, they will become as we are if they, if they get into this. So, you see, I, I, this is a lot on my mind at the moment because I'm doing a, a book on the history of the impact of plants over the millennia. And it seems to me that what happened and what our story is, is that uh, we had something very close to a symbiotic relationship with a goddess of some sort. I mean, it, it's hard from our position to try and understand this too much, too clearly, but it let it it lies, it lay through the plants and a religion of ecstasy and probably orgy and it's the religion of the great horned goddess at the dawn of prehistory but that we don't take seriously enough or we don't realize how important this 
symbiosis was, that it was actually regulating psychological tendencies in us which unregulated become uh, detrimental. And what I mean by that is, if you have a situation where every Saturday night or every new moon, your whole group just goes totally bananas on some kind of very powerful, visionary, plant hallucinogen, the characteristic of this from the point of view of an anthropologist is all boundaries are dissolved. Boundaries are dissolved. And this dissolving of boundaries is a psycholytic function that keeps ego from forming, almost like a gallstone in the social body. People are not egotistical in a situation where that kind of orgiastic psychedelic religion is being practiced because they know the relativity of self. They see it completely come apart. They know that they are their kin and the animals and the earth and the land. There's identification, not this retreat and the beginning of strategies based on gain for the center of this body. That kind of thing doesn't happen. And when these populations in Africa where this um, kind of thing I am hypothesizing went on, when those populations moved away, there then became uh, a frantic search for substitutes. And our inner restlessness over the centuries and our tendency to addict frantically to everything, to each other, to all kinds of things. It's because we are, uh, you know, the inheritors of an abused childhood, essentially. That an extremely traumatic thing happened to us. We were parted from this governing relationship with a p kind of planetary mind. And anybody who takes these hallucinogens will tell you calling it a planetary mind, calling it X, Y, or Z, doesn't do justice to the ineffable, mysterious depth of it. It's still there, this thing, whatever it is. And when you voyage into it, you discover, you know, my God, the cosmos is alive. It's not only alive, it's intelligent. It's not only intelligent, it's now looking at me. And, uh, you know, you, you have a whole series of assumption-dissolving realizations. So, uh, the archaic revival, again, I think will seek, when it finally gets its options sorted out, to kind of centerpiecing this relationship to this female planetary thing. I thought it was just off the wall that these people in Tiananmen Square built uh, a statue to a goddess, to a goddess of democracy that they literally just raised out of the rubble. I mean, if you don't think we live in an age of myths and symbols, uh, this, was, uh, this was powerful stuff. So, um, it's coming to the end of my hour. The only other thing I want to say before I, we take a break and then maybe have questions is um, I think that the kind of things that I'm saying to you this evening have more uh, cogency than ever before as a kind of a developing point of view among a number of people simply because there is more data on the table we're finding out more and more about the situation in which we're in to be specific, stuff like the ozone hole and uh, the depletion of the rainforest, the spread of epidemic disease, the clear breakdown of uh, centralized uh, myth-making authority at all levels, in China, in the Soviet Union, here we do it through cynicism. There they do it through idealism. But it, 
comes to the same thing. Everybody's just sick of their governments. Uh, so uh, what I want to say about this is uh, that for the first time since uh, the Greeks advanced the four, the Aristotle used the five basic solids to explain the structure of the universe, there are new mathematical cards on the table which seem to hold promise that the most complex kinds of natural phenomena are going to yield to mathematical analysis, which means linguistic analysis, which means, and I'm referring here to fractal uh, mathematics, which uses very simple codes, very short equations to produce uh, coastlines, Mm -hmm. thousands and thousands of ferns, millions and millions of orchids, uh, natural form of great complexity and beauty, but that's only a small class of what it produces. It also produces... uh, an infinity of worlds of alien beauty like nothing that we have ever seen before. And so what we are discovering through the power of the computer, which is nothing more than the power, the amplified power of mind and imagination, we are discovering infinitudes of sensory delight and uh, food for thought in these electronically generated places. Well, I don't know if this is where the culture is pointing, but I said in this talk, doors were being closed by the onrushing momentum into concrescence. This is true, but other doors are being flung open. Doors, some of them into bizarre realms of alien beauty that may yet uh, become real estate. Well, so that's just sort of an overview of my take on the situation. So then are there questions? Usually that's more interesting. Can you, um, is it appropriate to speak some about um, the work that you're doing with computers? Yes, part of what I do involves uh, a particular um, kind of modeling of time that involves the I Ching and uh, looking at historical data. The I Ching is as good a uh, barometer of historical change as, uh, as any other of these tools that depend on synchronicity for the way they work. But that's not really how I use it. I'm more interested in structure in the King Wen sequence and have construed out of that a kind of a time wave, uh, a map of novelty. Much of what I said this evening presupposed this idea, but you don't have to know this to to listen to me. But there is the idea that uh, part of what's wrong with how we see the world or why there's a certain problem and it doesn't always work for us the way we want it to is because there is a factor left out that we have failed to take account of. It's that um, science has taught us to pay a great deal of attention to the kinds of phenomena such that when you uh, recreate the initial conditions, the process happens the same way again. You know, they're very big on that. But all the more interesting phenomena in our lives, falling in love, making a career, having children, living, dying, uh, are non-repeatable and unique events. They're not amenable to this kind of scientific description. So uh, as a kind of intellectual game, what I tried to do was... Uh, take the Tao Te Ching and the I Ching and the notion of Tao, which is always presented as the most slippery of concepts, 
that's the major thing you come away with when you deal with Tao, is, boy, is this hard to understand. But I just thought, well, there are all these statements about Tao in the Tao Te Ching and the I Ching, statements such as, in the Whaley translation, the way that can be told of is not an unvarying way. Well, in spite of the double negative, you can tell that what it's saying is that it's a variable way. Well, if it's a variable way, it can be uh, pictured on a Cartesian coordinate. It can be treated as a graph. Well, when you begin to look at the uh, at Taoism and the intellectual preconceptions of the I Ching from this point of view, you begin to see that what you're dealing with is not the quaint aphorisms of primitive proto-Han so-and-sos, but actually an extremely sophisticated understanding of time as experienced, an understanding that actually exceeds anything up to the present day that we've been able to come up with. And why is this? It's because we took a wrong turn in our modeling of time. We, uh, and this happened with Newton, it, be, it is treated as what is called pure duration in Western philosophy. It simply means that you have to have this stuff in order to have processes because they need, need it. It's like a dimension into which you make available for then these things to manifest. But the the conception which lies behind the I Ching is uh, that time is composed of elements in the same way that um, Western science understands matter to be composed of 108, 110, whatever it is, elements. And that these uh, these, uh, temporal elements are like gestalts or archetypes. They somehow enclose and configure the space-time matrix in which they reside. They have quality, in other words. That's what I'm trying to say. They impart a quality so that... Not all time is alike. Sometimes have the quality of openness. Sometimes have the quality of closure. Sometimes, and so forth. They had the perspicacity to pay sufficient attention to their own experience that they noted this. And uh, what I've tried to do with the computer is carry forward this notion that time is not simply something which is either running down or getting harder. Some people think of time as a hill that gets steeper and steeper. But that it actually is a complex topological manifold over which uh, uh, events flow. And that this quality that I've referred to several times in the talk tonight called novelty is conserved in the let's call it the low points of the manifold, and that habit or recidivist tendencies tend to probabilistically cluster at high points in this manifold. Well, then, this is sort of like a feng shui of time. What we're saying, and it's like astrology, except astrology says, in my opinion, too much because it has so many um, uh, concepts or or idea, uh, actual occasions of ideational intention, which it brings together and clusters to create its interpretation. Well, what this simply says is there is a quality to being. Sometimes that quality is retrogressive and takes apart And sometimes that quality is progressive and integrative and connects and moves forward. And the essence of Tao is knowing when it is one and when it is the other and where the changeover points are. 
Well, small computers are very useful for modeling these kinds of flow processes. <coughs> um, I've been reading this guy talking about agriculture and ecology and that sort of stuff. And his thought was that more at this point will come from discovery of what is rather than invention of something new. And I just wondered what you thought. Well, I don't know if you can really distinguish between discovery and invention with what we're involved in. Uh, I agree that more now is known. Uh, see, we have now, actually, what has changed is that we have the power to remake the world. And we have the information and we have the contending strategies, the contending design strategies. What we lack is uh, the will. We have a heart problem. All else has been given unto us. All other ages in history stood by helplessly and watched disease, pogrom, madness, whatever was current, overtake them helplessly, we actually could form a response, but we are paralyzed by the momentum of our past. Or are we? And that then becomes the question. Because, you know, we're in a sinking submarine. Does anybody know how to start this thing for the surface? Or are we just all going to down, go down Captain Nemo style? It's not at all clear. But the reason I am so passionately committed to the psychedelic thing is because I see it as radical. And if this is not the moment for radical solutions, what is? I mean, you can preach a new paradigm and cultural reformation and caring society till you're blue in the face, but the only time in this century that we have seen massive social change in the industrial democracies was under the onslaught of psychedelics in the 1960s. And granted, there was a war and this, that, and the other, and a baby boom, but nevertheless, that's the only case we've seen. What we need to change is our mind. That's the part that's doing us dirt and dragging us under. How can we change our minds? And, of course, here at Esalen, you know, we indulge ourselves because everyone is extremely enlightened and they've been flown in and they're part of problem-solving task forces anyway and <laughs> like that. But, you know, my God, I toured, uh, I did some magazine work and went to Thailand and India fairly recently and the feeling that you get on the Asian continent is just that planet three is approaching the omega point. I mean, the rate at which metals are being ripped from the ground, forests cut down, people displaced, propaganda manufactured, uh, machines produced, it's pretty furious seen and no one is con in control these are all integrated processes there has to come at some point a deeper dialogue we have not been slammed to the wall i mean we talk crisis but even the people in this room who come from europe know what a soft scene this is because twice or three times, depending on how you're counting, in this century, Europe has been smashed to bits. And they're not little brown people off on the other side of the world. They are the same civilization as we are, and smashed to bits by the forces unleashed by the Enlightenment. So it's all about changing our minds getting hold of ourselves. The first thing is an abandonment of cultural pretension. We have nothing to teach anybody. My God, if there's anybody out there who ca has any ideas on how to steer us out of this, this is why we're importing every shaman from the Amazon, every Tibetan lama, every Mongolian goat herder is being <laughs> brought here 
and shaken by the lapels and said, you know, for God's sake, man, do you have answers? We have answers. Ken, I would like to hear you um, make a case for in what way the psychedelics could help us and in what way are they a radical solution? You cite the 60s and still that was put down and, and generally speaking, drugs are not held to in very high regard. And I think that the drug issue which is not, which until fairly recently I, like maybe many of you, assumed was this kind of side issue on the social agenda of what was happening. It now appears that actually this is directly in front of us as a civilization, that uh, we're going to go through some kind of convulsion over this issue. And I don't mean that there are going to be a lot of people addicted or a lot of people not addicted. I mean that it will be a financial convulsion. What has happened is that international criminal syndicates, largely put in place by uh, intelligence agencies in the 40s and 50s, uh, and in more recently in the case of cocaine, that these criminal syndicates have grown large, more powerful in many cases than entire nations, such nations as Bolivia, Ecuador, Peru. Uh, these nations are bought and sold by an industry that measures its profits in fractions of a trillion dollars. Now, these, these uh, drug cartels were put in place uh, out of historical bad habit. I mean, I don't know how many of you are aware of it, but in the 1840s, a war was fought in, along the coast of China that was called the Opium War. And the issue that the Opium War was fought over was the British government's desire to sell opium freely in the ports of China and the government of China telling them to forget it. And so they sent naval gunpowder and forcibly offloaded tonnage of opium. See, we think, or I, I thought until I looked into it, that opium was grown in China. Well, it was a part of the Chinese Materia Medica for thousands of years, but it was a very minor part. The, the opium that addicted China was grown in Goa under British mandate. Now, why were the British insisting that they be allowed to sell opium in the ports of China? Because another drug market that they had created, tea, had undergone a financial collapse. And they were stuck with 200 ships and port facilities that stretched from Liverpool to Macau. And they were taking a bath financially. And then somebody had the brilliant idea, we'll plant Goa into opium. And China is weak. We can force our way into Chinese ports and addict the Chinese population. And this was done. So as recently as the 1840s, so-called civilized governments were using military power to push opiates on populations that wanted none of it. So understand that the holy sanctimoniousness of the government's attitude on drugs is entirely situational and tailored for uh, very short-term consumption. It is not, uh, you don't have to be a wild-eyed radical to know that opium heroin production in Southeast Asia soared during the Vietnam War as a CIA strategy to pacify the black ghetto in the United States. I mean, that's how you do it. I mean, you flood the ghetto with junk and then, uh, you know, nobody's interested in fomenting for civil rights at that point. Now, the problem is that uh, the cocaine thing got completely out of hand. Cocaine was originally imaged as a relatively harmless stimulant 
that you could sell for big bucks to the white middle class and support all kinds of dirty little covert operations with the rake off, but have virtually no social consequences. The problem was they didn't uh, uh, reckon with the perverseness of human nature that could take a $120 gram of fluffed flake cocaine and turn it into $500 worth of super addictive crack. Well, you know, the major addiction wherever there are poor people is money. And the notion then of overturning the relationship of the ghetto to crack is impossible. So the government is grappling now with demons which it unleashed throughout the 20th century. And uh, I firmly believe that, you know, if, uh, if cocaine cost, if a gram of cocaine cost what a tube of airplane glue costs, then you wouldn't see fashionable and chic gentlemen uh, driving Porsches with airplane glue in their beards. It just wouldn't happen, you know. That the, it's the cost. It's the cost and the illicitness, the belief that everyone will become a dope fiend if drugs are legalized is once again the dominator culture stepping in and acting as the enforcing arm for religious fundamentalism. I mean, eventually the drug issue will take its place along with uh, the right to own property, the right of women to uh, a equal role in society, the abolition of slavery. It's part, uh, it's, uh, part of... Uh, a mature definition of human beings. It's preposterous to set yourself at war with nature like that. Now, where the psychedelic thing comes into this is not yet defined. There's a very interesting book called The Great Drug War by Trebek. And it's a 500-page book, has multiple appendices and indices and this and that, and he's a, a policy maker. And he's a good guy. He advocates legalization and so forth and so on. Yet, you look in the index of this book and you look up LSD and there's nothing. You look up psychedelics, nothing. MDMA, nothing. Psilocybin, nothing. Well, you realize that that's not even an issue to these people. They are so fixated on uh, these multi-billion dollar industries that even the advocates of legalization treat it like a unwanted guest. But what is really, I think, behind all this is that this restless search through nature for stimulants, aphrodisiacs, uppers, downers, sideways trips, is a legacy of this symbiosis of the origin period and that when we finally find our way back to those substances then there will be a measure of peace of mind you have to realize that even in the west which is the most anti-psychedelic of all societies uh, even in the west the connection has only been broken since Alaric the Visigoth burned Eleusis sometime in the 4th century. So it's been less than 2,000 years that even the wellsprings of Western spirituality were uh, refreshed by this particular tradition. And the shamanism then is an effort to recapture it no, to no less a degree than Eleusis was also an archaic revival. They were looking back to the great uh, mother religion of Minoan Crete. I mean, it was always said in, classic, in the classical text that what was done in secret at Eleusis was done openly uh, uh, at Gnosis on Crete. So it's, it's even in our tradition not that long ago, but it is 
thoroughly suppressed by the confluence of dominator styles that emerged with the triumph of uh, Christianity and the emergence of that patriarchal and then the the real nail in the coffin was the the phonetic alphabet evolving in Greece and then printing and by then the walls were so high and the force is propelling us towards uh, scientific industrialism so uh, undeniable that we had to undergo this but we are like a prodigal child I mean we made a descent into historical time to learn the secrets of matter apparently a kind of Faustian obsession mm-hmm. that we played out to the end, the end meaning until that moment when we could bring the light of the stars to the surface of the earth to exterminate our enemies. And then the contradictions and the consequences of that kind of madness made us either extinct or unrecognizable to ourselves. I mean, that's really the choice. Uh, the change that must come has to be radical. We are well set up for radical change at the physiological level, but at the cultural level, we have a terrific kind of constipation that threatens to become fatal. These boundary-dissolving techniques are what we need And, you know, all of them are uh, but a mere gesture at the problem except these very powerful visionary hallucinogens. So, you know, it's an emergency situation. Do you see geomancy as part of a radical solution? Well, I think that what we're becoming aware of is... uh, that boundary dissolution, that the vanishing of the difference between self and world means that we're catching up to the, the changes that went on in physics in the early 20th century. Everything is being replaced by fields. Everything is seen now as a transient interference pattern rather than something with an integrity that persists in time. To the degree that geomancy uh, accentuates and stresses this field phenomenon, the wave mechanical nature of Gaia, I, I think so. I don't know what is to become of us. The really odd thing about all this is that apparently we are unable to continue to live here. You know, whether we want to or not, it's almost gotten to the place that it's just become too much. The place is bursting at the seams. The whole thing should be turned into a park. But where are you going to put all the people? And so, uh, you know, the New Age can dissolve, I think, most dichotomies But what are you going to do about the question of whether or not we are strangers in this universe or whether this is our only and native home to which we must devote great care and attention? I mean, we have both tendencies. If you look at what culture is doing, it appears to be giving us no choice. We have to leave the planet if we love it. If you love it, leave it. Because to stay is to toxify. So, you know, there, we, it cannot be denied that the earth is the cradle of humanity. The question is simply, can we remain in the cradle forever? And I am ambivalent about this. I, I no longer have my uh, youthful enthusiasm for an unambiguous migration to Alpha Centauri. Uh, I entertain it still, but, you know, that was pre-challenger. Now we know too much about the worms who run these things and uh, what it's really all about and how slow it's moving. I mean, it's moving slowly. 
it's moving so slowly. Even the Russians. I mean, I felt like I should write a letter to Gorbachev in the interests of perestroika. They're cutting back on the space program. I said, my God, this is the one thing you have which nobody else has. Why don't you just go for it? But there is, you know, ambivalence. And I don't think you conquer the universe uh, with an attitude of ambivalence. So we're on hold. Nobody knows what's going on. And do you have to just surrender to the irrational and put your faith in friendly, that friendly flying saucers are on the way? I mean, this is the response of many people. Or is it within the power that we have within ourselves to change our minds? Well, to the best of my knowledge, having toured the world and met a lot of strange people and spent a lot of time on this and read a lot of books, the only thing which looks like it holds a chance in hell is some configuration of the psychedelic experience because it alone sufficiently perturbs assumptions that you can begin to see how there might be a possible dialogue. So the, our, our relationship to matter, to plutonium, to heroin, to cocaine, to psychedelics, to consumer goods, all of these things, you see, we are an addictive animal we are bereft and on the bounce and willing to settle for almost anything and half crazy in the process. And the notion is, and it emerges, it comes from the unconscious, I think, as I look at the 20th century, that the only thing which can steady us in this situation is that long, long backward reach to the campfires of the Magdalenian when uh, religion was an experience. You see, that's what they've taken from us. We are entirely disempowered in our own self-experience of the immediacy of being. We are always, we want to wait and see what the New York Times says about it or the evening news. And it's not true until it comes that way, validated that way. And we have no vocabulary for our emotions. We have thousands of words for the chemical structure of the uh, soil of Mars or, you know, the interior processes of the sun. But we have a very impoverished emotional vocabulary and this is culturally accumulated over thousands of years one of the great boons of psychedelics is that they are catalysts for language permission to send the mind where it's never gone before and leave a linguistic map that others can use so we're trying to stretch the envelope shed the monkey abandon uh, the cultural, uh, the thanatoptic drive to ruin, really, that has characterized this Faustian relationship uh, to the world. It's been, it's been all wrong. It's not working. I mean, you don't have to be very bright to see this. So now we need to talk about ways out. I do not think of myself as uh, an expert or a teacher. I think of myself as a wayfarer who happened upon these extremely intense experiences that are the legacy of this kind of shamanism worldwide and that seems to me to be something which they are saving for us and keeping for us if we are willing to, you know, come in out of the rain. Anybody else? Yeah. And I think the uh, uh, critical mass of consciousness will bring it like that when it happens. It's a filter and a control, but it will emerge. And I agree with you. It could be very, it could be instantly. I mean, 
this thing in China crystallized with appalling speed. I mean, the CIA, nobody understood what was going on. They still don't understand what's going on. It just, there comes a time and the switch is turned and the morphogenetic field comes on and people begin to act. And, you know, the things that we are seeing, we have a great deal of difficulty getting in perspective because it's moving so quickly. And I venture to say you ain't seen nothing yet. I mean, it's just beginning to pull and tear and uh, reconfigure itself. And it has a mind of its own. It has a will of its own. It is, uh, we are atoms within the organizational plan of this, uh, of this thing. And so then the, the task becomes really to witness this, to be with it, to see it, to replicate the memes associated with it and pass them around linguistically and to uh, empower people to believe in their intuition, empower them to go with the, the hope. Question. Yeah. Concerning the new mathematics that you mentioned, uh-huh. would there be any relationship by any chance between that and Bucky Fuller's synergetics? Well, he worked basically in the realm of one class of these things because he was fascinated with certain shapes, but the 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 qualities that he was able to get out of his structures reside in the fact that they were taking advantage of these kinds of uh, of natural principles nature modeling nature this is what we haven't done see we we've always gone for the big flash the high heat release the the and and Nature does her most interesting tricks with voltages below that of a flashlight battery. I mean, that's where it's happening. Like in your head, for instance, you know. I mean, the gr- our method was to start with the grossest phenomena and work downward. And we've been doing it for 500 years. Now we think we understand how two billiard balls theoretically relate to each other, but not three. (laughs) This is called the three-body problem. And there are similar problems. I mean, our biology is a fiction. We do not understand how you can think, I will close my hand into a fist, and it happens. Mind over matter, a miracle. Still, totally beyond the ken of science, because you see what's happening is intentionality is somehow affecting gross matter. And you can talk about quantum mechanical junctions and this and that and the other thing, but it's all guesswork. Well, then when you turn to psychology, it's smoke signals plus (laughs) guesswork, you know? So uh, since abstraction has served us so ill, why not return to feeling? Why not return to symbols? Why not return to rituals, gestalts, archetypes, analogy, analogical reasoning is extremely powerful, has worked very well in the past for sophisticated societies. We, We have fatal styles of thought that we are fatally addicted to. And uh, unless we break out of that kind of unexamined ego, which is what it is, then we have a pretty much a appointment in Samara, I'm afraid. But if we're willing to examine that, then the, the human horizon is endlessly bright. I mean, we represent some kind of ontological experiment on the part of something that is either calling us home or going toward its deepest self, or, I mean, there's love here. There's some kind of love, there's some kind of other, there's some kind of caring across the project of being. And this is, you know, the grand task of philosophy, to, to witness and to unravel and to make uh, immediate 
in people's lives. Well, that's it for this evening. Thank you very much.